Hello friends, this is Vijay. Welcome to Forum IAS Hindu Daily. In our today's discussion, we are going to see the list of topics in the display. Okay. Without any delay, let us dive into the first topic. The first topic, India sends notice to PAP to Amman 1960 Indus Pact. Indus Treaty is one of the most famous and successful international river water treaty, okay, which have been existed between India and Pakistan. It actually had been brokered by the World Bank. Okay, so these are the few facts you should know. And based on the Indus Pact, India have been having the full access to the the eastern rivers. Okay, the Ravi, BS, and Satluj, and Indus, Jhelum, Chenab. Those are the west part of the Indus River Channel, and it have been controlled by the Pakistan. So these days. India have been building the Kishan Ganga River Water Project. Okay, it is a 330 megawatt project. So it have been constructed across the Neelam River. Okay, the river name is Neelam. And Neelam is a tributary of Jhelum. Okay, so Pakistan have been raising the concerns, but instead of approaching the uh, neutral expert or the permanent court of uh, Indus Water Commission, they have been approaching the permanent court of arbitration in the Hague. Okay, so right now they have been moving through the court procedures. Okay, so this is the issue. So that's what India have been asking to amend the 16, 1960 Indus Pact. Okay, here they have given some few facts. The Indus system of river comprises the main river and its tributaries namely Ravi, Bias, Sutlej, Jhelum and Chenab. Kindly go through the tributaries and distributaries of these rivers and their origins. Okay. Then the treaty provides India absolute control of all waters of the eastern rivers. I already told you India have been controlling the eastern flowing rivers. Pakistan have been controlling the western flowing rivers. Then Pakistan's Nal receive for unrestricted use of all waters of the western rivers, Indus, Jhelum, and Chenab. India is permitted to use the waters of the western rivers for domestic use, non-consumptive use, agriculture, generation of hydroelectric power project to certain conditions. Here, what are the conditions? India can construct the hydro projects in the western flowing rivers also, but it should not affect the flow of the river. So, India can construct the runoff river projects across the west flowing rivers but it is not supposed to construct major hydro projects okay but uh, kishan ganga project it is a 330 megawatt project it is a major project india have been constructing across the neelam river okay now let us see the few facts what are the issues okay what are the issues means pakistan had sub objected to the india's construction of 330 megawatt kishan ganga hydroelectric project on the Jhelum river it is a, on the project is on the Neelam river I already told you Neelam is a tributary of Jhelum okay this is a Neelam river and Pakistan protested against plans to construct the 850 megawatt rattle hydroelectric project on Chenab it is another one project India is going to construct across the Chenab okay so the power production capacity will be 850 megawatt so this is the issue the pakistan have been rising but instead of approaching the neutral expert or uh, the permanent indus commission the pakistan have been approaching the permanent court of arbitration okay they will be uh, doing the dispute settlement for the international issues especially between the countries and it have been locating in the hague okay so here the dispute mechanism resolution is already available under the Indus Water Treaty 1960. Okay, so that is the Permanent Indus Commission. Because of the actions of the Permanent Indus Commission, the treaty, the 1960 Indus Water Treaty, is uh, so successful in its implementation. But the World Bank is also appointed the neutral expert. But uh, these days, the Pakistan have been taking the issues to the 
permanent court of arbitration rather solving the disputes through the windows in indus water treaty like permanent indus commission and the world bank appointed neutral experts okay then the reasons what are the reasons for the india's move to amend the 1960 this is the main issue the dispute resolution is already available but india have been stated that why pakistan have been knocking the doors of the permanent court of arbitration so this is the concern raised by india and pakistan's move to approach the court of arbitration is unilateral because without asking india it have been knocking the doors of permanent court of arbitration and it initiates the simultaneous process for the same question okay so these are the stand taken by india and the inconsistent judgments will dilute the purpose of the indus water treaty of 1960 till today the resolutions taken on the indus water treaty is mutually consensual agreements okay but these days the pakistan have been uh, taking the issues single handedly to the permanent court of arbitration so what india have been saying is it will dilute the uh, the original purpose of the indus water treaty like that india have been stating okay now the second topic rise in water bad recorded in kerala's capital so these days the asian water bad census have been going on and it have been taken by the wwf and the social forestry wing of the forest department asian water bad census it is a part of the international water bad census okay in india bombay natural historical society and the forest departments these days actually forest departments have been playing a role but before that bnhs was the leading organization in taking the asian water bad census and here they have given some few facts and what are the bats which have been visiting the kerala's capital like that they have they have given and punchakari valyani wetland complex it is in the trivandrum district okay and uh, another one river actually they had given the poor estuary okay poor estuary nayar river have been flowing there okay in the poor estuary so these are the areas which have been hosting the the incomers from offshore nations okay so these are the few incomers which have been cited by the asian water bad census and the pacific golden plover okay it is the iucn least concern category and western yellow wagtail it is also in the iucn least concern category painted stork it is a near threatened as per iucn status and eurasian spoonbill it is also a least concern okay and in this in these sites the asian water bird census they also noted about the wood sandpaper and the oriental data here in the news article they had given that oriental data okay so it is a wrong oriental data is the right one okay so oriental data is a near threatened category they had just given the anthropogenic activities okay related to anthropogenic activities in and around the trivandrum and what are the bats they have been visiting this punchakari balyani wetland complex and the poor estuary this is what they had provided and whenever you are going through this article you should know about the few basics of the asian water bat census okay this year even though they recorded 65% increase in the water bats but the total count is uh, marginally small compared to the last year they this year actually the water bird okay the amount of water bird is it found a 65% increase but the total bird count is bit lower than the last year's census and here another one species black crown night heron it is a least concern okay and whenever you are studying about the asian water bird census or the migratory of birds you should know about the avian botulism because in the last year in the sambar lake of rajasthan there was a mass mortality of the birds the reason behind this mass mortality was avian botulism it was caused by the bacteria clostridium botulinum okay it had been causing the paralytic and fatal diseases and the botulinum you might be knowing that the clostridium botulinum will be secreting the natural toxins 
so these ingestion of toxins will be leading to the paralytic and fatal diseases the signs are the neck drooping and dullness depression paralysis of limbs etc so these are the few signs the bad will be showing before their death and mostly it have been appearing in the bird bird cycle especially one bird will be eating the the another dead bird right so there alone it have been reflecting and the humans are also in the threat category if the humans are consuming the the bacterial affected meat means then they will also prone to attract the botulism okay so this is one of the important point you should know then let us see the few basics about the asian water bird census asian water bird census i already told you it is a part of the international water bird census okay and it have been coordinated by the wetlands international and here upsc might trick you by giving the bird life international so you should remember that the asian water bird census it have been taken by the wetlands international in india bombay natural historical society and wwf and these days forest departments also taking a lead role what are the significances of the asian water bird census the one is convention on the biological diversity and another one is the convention on the migratory species the data from the asian water bird census will be helping the government and the ngos about the data of the the prevailing biological diversity in the region and the migratory visitors from the offshore nations okay so this is what the data of the asian water birds have been getting used this is the third article for the day and it is a editorial part okay this article came in the editorial part of the today's newspaper let us see the article in detail here in the intro part the author have been discussing the two contradictory situations one the proclamation made by the chairman of tata sons in world economic forum meeting which have been happened in the davos to achieve the trillion trillion dollar economy we want three things the three are growth growth and growth so this is the proclamation made by the tata chairman okay and in the second scenario he have been quoting the another contradictory situation of the eviction of 150 homeless people beneath the flyover by police okay uh, to clear the city of beggars ahead of the various g20 events to be held in the city these days the arrangements have been happening in the uh, country's capital therefore the people have been evicting this 150 homeless people beneath the flyover okay so these are the two contradictory situations and in the job demand employment and informality he have been quoting certain crises what we are facing in the indian economy but before getting there we should know the basics these are the few facts you should know while studying these topics let me tell you in detail the first one the employment elasticity you might be known the meaning of the elasticity right here in the employment elasticity what it means that you should know right so here it is the ability or a capacity of an economy to generate employment opportunities for its population as a percent of its growth process every year the population have been growing right like uh, 7% 8% like that the population have been growing according to the population growth we should create avenues for the employment else there will be a unemployment scenario which will be paving the way to the spiking in the crime rate okay so therefore it have been referring to the employment generation to the population growth so this is what the employment elasticity means and you should know about the gdp the gross domestic product gross domestic product is nothing but a, the total quantum of the services and the products what we are produced in our country every year so this is the gdp here the participation from the foreign nationals will also be included and in the gnp we will be excluding the participation of the foreigners in india but we will be including the participation of indians in offshore nations okay so this is how the gnp will be arrived and the gross gdp is nothing but a gdp after depreciation every year we might be producing certain uh, services and uh, products to replace the older ones right so there will be a wear and tear rate 
so to replace those old stuffs we will be allocating the products and services from the current seg segment so this is what the gross gdp will be doing and they will be counting the gdp after the depreciation and nominal gdp means here the total production of the products and services will be counted according to the current price prevailing in the market and the real gdp means the gdp will be calculated by taking the base year price suppose today we are producing some 10 tomatoes okay 10 tomatoes and according to the today's price uh, it have been around some 2 per piece okay 2 per pieces so the nominal gdp will be 20 rupees okay but the real gdp we had taken one per piece so according to the real gdp it will be around the 10 rupees so this is how the nominal gdp and real gdp will be calculated every year and here in the job demand employment and informality he have been quoting about the the elasticity prevailing in the indian economy he have been mentioning that the employment elasticity is declining with respect to india therefore the job creation has not keep pace with the demand for the jobs okay so the elasticity is very low therefore the job creation is very low like that he have been quoting and moreover the formal jobs prevailing in the economic market they are not providing the social security to the employees so these are the things he have been quoting here and second political related uh, statements are there that you no need to study in the bottom he have been quoting that india have been not reaping the entire benefits of the globalization okay so this is the cause of the problem like that he have been quoting and the conventional economics what conventional economics they have been telling they have been arguing for the uh, the uh, we need to move the labor force from the unproductive agriculture sector to the most productive service sector like that the conventional economics they have been stating okay this is what they had given in this paragraph because in india the boom have been happening after the infusion of the information technology right because almost some 70 percent of the uh, 64 to 70 percent of the contribution is coming from the service sectors but 50 percent of the labor force they have been participating in the agriculture almost uh, 50 percent okay not exactly the 50 percent almost 50 percent of the labor force they have been participating in the agriculture domain therefore we need to move the labor force from the agriculture sector to the most productive service sector like that the conventional economists they have been stating here he have been saying that today instead of formalizing the informal sectors the informalization of formal sector have been happening like uh, these days the prevalence of the contractual employment is very high and uh, jig work is getting popular okay so these are the things actually they have been informalizing the the prevailing formal sectors so this is what he have been stating here under the title confusion in employment policies he have been bringing in the the role of the women who have been playing in the indian economy okay now let us see in brief manner this is what the job demand employment and informality have been saying okay so the declining employment elasticity we had uh, discussed and the conventional economist the quote by the conventional economist we discussed okay and in the con confusion in employment policies India's formal sector cannot create good jobs. The reason there is a structural lacuna which have been prevailing in the Indian economy. Moreover, the workforce from the human women side is very low. Okay, the female labor participation rate is somewhere around 19 percent. But here in the map, you can see that the female labor participation prevailing in the various uh, neighborhood nations and in the of other other offshore nations here in india it have been around some 19 percent okay it reached a uh, top percent of 35 percent okay but uh, in the pandemic and in the post pandemic period it is reeling between the 17 to 19 percent and in even in sri lanka it have been around some 33 percent okay and in the well developed china it is around 63 percent okay 
63 percent female labor participation rate is there so because of the surplus female labor participation rate they have been producing the goods in a competitive price and in Nepal they are having 80 percent okay the female labor participation in their labor force is almost 80 percent in Nepal okay so these are the few things we should know and here they had the author had discussed about the the role of women in the Indian economy today even though the formal sectors they close the gate for the women the women have been actively uh, playing as a caregivers farm workers domestic workers then municipal sweepers etc okay the essential services of women are not considered as productive to the society but the value or the uh, the pay what they are getting is very low but they should get their desired pay right so this is what the author have been discussing here even though if we pull the women into the formal sector means definitely it will increase the the total gdp and the female labor participation rate in india but these days we didn't provide any employment avenues to the young men itself so this is what the author have been quoting so it will lead to the massive unemployment scenario in india which will pave the way for the higher crime rate okay so therefore we need to create the sufficient employment avenues for the both men and women like that the author have been stating and the downside of gdp growth in the conclusion part he have been discussing the the negative side of gdp growth what is mean by the gdp like that he have been stating and what are the negative side effects of the gdp growth because in the G to spur the gdp growth we will be constructing the roadways dams etc and all right so it will increase the the destruction to the natural environment prevailing in the country so we hadn't see any negative side effects of the gdp like that the author have been quoting and gdp these days it have been swelling the wealth creation of the investors as per the oxfam report one percent of the the top elites they have been controlling the 40 percent of the resources okay so generally gdp have been providing wealth creation to the investors alone and it had not providing the the equal income to the the labor force especially the employees so these are the few concerns he have been quoting in the conclusion part therefore state need to reinvent the the term gdp therefore purna swaraj will be the only solution i think the author will be having a gandhian viewpoint so he have been quoting the purna swaraj which means the economic liberty and the social liberty to the every citizen of india so this is what the goal he have been targeting in the conclusion part now let us see the fourth article india's groundwater governance is in better shape okay so this is the article kindly go through the article now let us discuss it here in the introduction part he have been stating that the india have been sharing a 18 percent of the population and the groundwater resource okay india has the four percent groundwater resource of the entire globe and two percent of the land share is keeping by the india so this is what he have been discussing in the the intro part and he have been mentioning the the theme of the un world water day the groundwater making the invisible visible this is the theme of the un world water day okay and here in the map actually i picked this map from the times of india and here you can see the water stress areas okay if the water stress is very high means it should be above 80 percent so these are the extremely high regions and it have been prevailing in the the desert regions of rajasthan and the delhi metro and the adjacent gujarat and the western up regions so these are the highly stressed area in india and in the scientific approach topic he have been quoting about the atal bujal yojana and the national project on aquifer management recently a report came and in it and in that report it uploaded the the effort of the government uh, regarding the water conservation especially the groundwater conservation so he have been quoting the atal bujal yojana you should know the few basics about the atal bujal yojana it is a participatory groundwater management which means we are inducting the communities in the 
conservation process of the ground waters okay therefore we are incentivizing them so this is the basic principle of the atal bujal yojana community participation and the incentivization okay and atal bujal yojana it is a centrally sponsored scheme uh, there are two variants are there right central uh, central sector scheme and centrally sponsored scheme atal bujal yojana it is a centrally sponsored scheme and the share is 50 50 between the union government and the world bank this is the scheme which we have been witnessing the participation of the world bank and the second scheme he have been quoting is national project on aquifer management here we are doing the survey both the traditional way and these days we have been using the heliborn based survey let us see the heliborn based survey later in the same article and the implementing agency with respect to the national project on aquifer management is central groundwater board so under the national project on aquifer management they will be analyzing the health of the aquifers prevailing in the country and they have been categorized it as a stressed safe like that okay so there are various categories of aquifers are there in india so based on that stress levels they are categorized it i already told you the groundwater assessment report 2022 it recently came and it used various scientific approaches to monitor okay so these are the few findings of the report and it find that there is a three percent reduction in the number of over exploited units i already told you the stressed unit exploited units and over exploited units are there and based on this report we came to know about the three percent reduction in the over exploited units and the safe units okay the here in the safe units the health of the aquifer will be in a good condition so there is a four percent spike in the safe units the overall extraction is also on the decline almost 3.25 percent uh, the government had taken various initiatives in the irrigation industrial and domestic use okay so therefore we brought the overall extraction to about 3.25 percent what are the thrusters behind this success the comprehensive groundwater guidelines which was issued in the 2020 and the NOC these days for the industry and all the NOC central have been providing through the web based applications which have been ensuring the transparency in the application process okay so these are the few thrusters which have been enhancing the success of the groundwater conservation and here in the report they also quoted that the additional groundwater potential okay of 9.37 billion cubic meter we had created through the artificial water conservation which is an best example of the cooperative federalism because with respect to the groundwater conservation both the state government and the central government they have been uh, working in a working to create a win-win situation for both the state agencies and the central agencies in the need for source sustainability topic he have been concluding it okay and here he have been quoting that the population pressure and the climate change have been stressing the water resource due to the population explosion almost 1.3 billion the nation have been hosting okay 1.3 billion citizens are there in india so it have been paving the way for the rapid industrial expansion and extensive infrastructure development then agricultural expansion okay so it have been taking a toll on the water resource in the country apart from that these days india have been witnessing the massive climate change related factors they are also putting stress on the water resources especially the groundwater aquifers okay so this is what he have been quoting and the groundwater source extraction should be kept less than 70 percent so these are the few measures he have been mentioning for the source sustainability the groundwater source extraction should be less than 70 percent and we need to increase the groundwater observation wells and the digital recorder and all we need to put into action then the real-time monitoring is the mandatory thing we need to follow to ensure the source sustainability apart from these measures the aquifer mapping and the data dissemination are the vital method we need to follow to ensure the long-term sustainability so these are the things he have been discussing here in this article now let us discuss few basics about the heliborn survey technology which i have been using in the national aquifer mapping okay 
to map the potential of the groundwater sources and its management for providing safe drinking water to millions of people living in the water scarce and arid regions of our country the project it is a 150 crore project okay and it have been operating under the ministry of jal shakti for the national aquifer mapping okay the arid regions of the northwestern india spread over <coughs> the states of rajasthan gujarat haryana and punjab almost 10% of the geographical area of the country have been covered under the helibond survey and the areas they are having the rainfall between the 100 to 400 mm so therefore they have been facing the acute shortage of the water throughout the year okay this project it will be leading to the high resolution pictures which will be aiding the states in taking the conservation measures okay this is what it have been discussing here now let us dive into the last topic of the article uh, today's analysis the cheetah project to bring in 12 big cats from south africa okay so the government signed the mou okay for bringing in the 12 cheetahs from south africa and they will be translocated to india earlier in the last year we procured almost 8 cheetahs and they were translocated to the kuno palpur national sanctuary in madhya pradesh and these eight cheetahs it came from the namibia right so these 12 cheetahs also will be conserved in the kuno national park in madhya pradesh and in india you might be known that cheetah became extinct in the year of 1948 so almost in india we are having eight cheetahs these days among the eight cheetahs what we translocated to the kuno national park oh, i think two cheetahs they have been suffering from the hematorenal failures okay so we don't know what happened to him and uh, their reports from the veterinary doctors it have been stating that their vitals are normal let us see in the future let us see about in the future and what does the mou on reintroduction of the cheetah say it will establish a viable and secure cheetah population in india and it will promote the conservation and ensures expertise is shared and exchanged okay so in this project we are going to get the expertise from the south africa and it will help us to maintain the viable cheetah population in india apart from that this mou also have been focusing on capacity building to promote the cheetah conservations okay so these are the few things you should know now let us discuss briefly about the kuno national park kuno national park it have been spreading in the madhya pradesh state and it is a part of the kathiawar and gir dry deciduous forest you might be known the what are the trees it will be present in the dry deciduous right tendu pala amaltas kayar okay these are the few trees there the, it will be there in the dry deciduous forest tendu palas amaltas kayar so tendu pala amaltas kayar are the few trees which have been prevailing in the dry deciduous forest of india and in kuno national park the distributary of chambal river have been flowing the river name is kuno river okay and why was the kuno chosen because it has the capacity to carry all the big cats all the four big cats the tiger leopard asiatic lion and the cheetah so here there is a brief description about the cheetahs they are the oldest of the big cat species the ancestors had been traced back about the 8.5 million years okay so compared to the human evolution the the evolution of cheetah is uh, very high and the number of cheetahs just around 7500 individuals globally in india we are having only 8 individuals according to the iucn cheetahs had stated as a vulnerable species and asiatic cheetahs and northwestern african cheetahs they are listed as a critically endangered and throughout the world cheetahs lost almost 90% of their global habitat and these 7500 individuals they have been living in only in the 9% of its historic range okay these are the few facts you should know about the cheetahs now let us discuss the prelims questions consider the following statements with respect to the indus water treaty indus water treaty 1960 India got control over the rivers Ravi, Bias, Jhelum, including the Chenab. Here, India got control over the three 
uh, eastern rivers right ravi bs jhelum but not the west flowing chenab because indus jhelum chenab they have been belong to the pakistan and pakistan have been controlling it under the indus water treaty the treaty was broken by the international rivers foundation it is a ngo okay actually the treaty was broken by the world bank it was not broken by the international rivers foundation then the third statement the treaty gives india 80% of water from the indus river system it is not a 80% only 20% of the water from the indus water uh, indus river water system have been controlled by the india and 80% of the water have been controlled by the pakistan okay so almost all the statements are incorrect and answer option 3 is the right one because they have been asking for the incorrect here it is a spell spelling error so incorrect okay so for the first question answer option c is the answer we didn't discuss about the gdp deflator today but in the previous analysis we discussed about it so that's what the question came and gdp deflator recently appeared in news is relate is appear in news is mentioned by they had given four options nominal gdp divided by real gdp into 100 real gdp divided by nominal gdp into 100 then the third option nominal gdp minus real gdp into 100 the fourth option nominal gdp minus real gdp divided by real gdp into 100 answer option a is the right one i think in 2018 or 2019 i couldn't remember they had asked the same question okay so the nominal gdp divided by the real gdp into 100 is the right answer and the gdp deflator generally it will be used to measure the inflation apart from the consumer price index the government have been using gdp deflator to measure the inflation these days okay because it will give you a big picture of the inflation now let us discuss the main question the population explosion and ever younger industrial sector have been ruining the india's groundwater potential discuss okay so this is the first part then in the second part they had given that also enumerate the measures taken by government to safeguard the groundwater resources in india okay here in in today's article we have seen certain measures for safeguarding the river uh, groundwater conservation that you can enumerate here it is a general topic the first part is a general topic you can write it on your own okay the population explosion and the industrial sectors how they have been ruining the groundwater potential that you should give so just try it let me catch you in a tomorrow's analysis thank you for your patience bye